Good morning, gents, from the middle of the U.S. Morning. Good morning. <laughs> evening. Oh, good morning, evening, and good afternoon, and hopefully not from too many people, uh, good middle of the night, but um, welcome to our fourth Open Clock Club. We made it to a month old, yay! Uh, so a little mini celebration needed there. Um, a bit of housekeeping before we get started. As always, this event is being recorded and will uh, be posted on YouTube. So if you want to remain anonymous, keep your camera turned off. Uh, if, uh, the live chat, as always, is being handled by team Bishop Thorpe Road Books here. So that's really important because we're able to download the live chat after I go through and find out questions and that develops uh, our kind of content throughout the week on social media and so on. So um, yeah, keep that coming, please. Rachel will be responding to you. Uh, please ask questions as we go along. And we're gonna split as always this hour into three sessions. So at about quarter past six GMT, we're gonna take a few minutes for a comfort break. And then at about quarter two or something, uh, seven will do the same thing. So it's been a super busy week here um, at How to Repair Pendulum Clocks with, um, let's just check, oh, that's the chat. Thank you, Frankie. Uh, I'll just check, we've got no more people waiting to be admitted. Um, it's been a super busy week. I've joined the NAWCC uh, chat forum thing, which I'm really uh, pleased about, is brilliant. People are incredibly supportive. Uh, everybody's super friendly. And um, so I've started to dig into uh, a couple of conversations there, which is, which is really cool. We're trying to establish ourselves as uh, somebody who's uh, willing to help. So this week, what we're doing is we're talking, uh, we're responding to questions. Now the questions that we've got, and we're open to more, so please don't hold back. Uh, I'll run through in a second, but just for the next couple of weeks, because it's Christmas, uh, next week, yes, we'll be here. If anybody wants to join us, we'll be online. And next week is Horological Quiz Week. And we will be, um, we've got a prize. We don't quite know what that prize is yet. It reminds me of that old joke. First prize is one of our new books and second prize is two of our new books. Uh, anyway, um, the <laughs> uh, so next week's Quiz Week uh, on Boxing Day. So please join us then. And the week after, which is early January, we'll go back to tool week as well. Um, so we'll be giving away uh, a vintage tool. So again, please put that in your diaries. And something for the new year that I've been thinking about is that it would be really great to learn more about you people. So please in the live chat, is the live chat working? Rachel? Yeah. In the live chat, if you want to come on to this session and do a 10 minute talk, that can be either about you and your practice, about a particular clock that you're working on, maybe a book review. We don't care, but we'd really love for you to see more of you because at the moment it's all a bit of me uh, ranting in your direction. So get in touch with the, uh, with the live chat and um, we'll get you booked in for the new year to do a 10 minute talk. Cool. Okay, so today we've got quite a lot to get through, as always. Um, we, you might remember, and you may have seen my new uh, video about mainsprings on the YouTube channel, Matthew Reed. Um, so we're just going to wrap up. We're not going to spend too long on that, but we're just going to tie up the kind of, uh, if we can, and it's a big subject, so it could go on forever. Um, our kind of thoughts about um, this idea of duration of the clock uh, and mainsprings. Then uh, we've been asked by Dave, so hi Dave, um, in terms of moving from beginner to uh, sort of intermediate and developing your practice, uh, what clocks should I be working on? So obviously we recommend, as you'll be familiar with by now, that you kind of start on one of these uh, badges, a single train Enfield clock, and I'll explain why when we get talking about that. But where do you go from there in order to build up enough um, experience and confidence 
thinking that you've got a wide range of experience to go on and maybe make the leap to being uh, in practice, as in charging for work or taking in work, or even thinking about where do you go with specialisms once you've covered these kind of so-called sort of basic uh, everyday domestic clocks. So that's um, what we're going to talk about then. After we've dealt with that, we're going to talk about cleaning, the world's most controversial subject. Uh, and that'll be a bit uh, later on in the hour. We've had two questions very similar. One, and they're both, um, which slightly surprised me really, but it's, it's cool that people have asked them. Both people have asked the same question, and that is about cleaning a clock um, that's, uh, you know, it, without taking it apart, immersing it in some solvent chemical, or maybe using an ultrasonic tank. So without taking the wheels out of the train, which I didn't really understand that people did. So that'll be cool. But what I'd like you to be thinking about before we get onto that is what we mean by cleaning, um, uh, because that's kind of where we need to get to before we talk about taking uh, the clock apart. So all good? Yeah, all good. Keep the live chat um, rolling. Oh, be just before we start, um, the, we've had a lot of inquiries about people who are looking at our book one. Sorry. Um, we've got a lot of inquiries. I've taken off the motion work with a question on the live chat about bushing. Now, it just happens that uh, John and I uh, have been writing our second book, which we feel covers uh, bushing pretty comprehensively. We hope, anyway, we'll find out when we publish it. Well, that book isn't going to be out until next summer. So what we've done is we're, hast not hastily, but we're working hard at putting together two chapters. And of course, when you do bushing, in our view, bushing is meaningless until you do depthing first. So we're going to publish as an e-publication, uh, bushing and depthing with a couple of exercises in there um, and hopefully get that out immediately for the new year. So that's what we're what we're after. So somebody was asking what does this clock look like from the other side. Um, I've taken the motion work off. So let's just go back to our spring and maybe we can tie that up um, pretty quickly. So. You may remember that last week and in the uh, video, what we said was um, a couple of things that might be kind of quite controversial is that obviously when a clock is made, it's made as a retail product, uh, the, most of the clocks that we tend to work on anyway, and they were sold as 30 hour clocks or eight day clocks or month clocks or whatever. And as the spring ages, uh, and the clock wears, of course, maybe the clock doesn't run for its full period. And the question was, what do you do? And my rather drawn out answer to that in the YouTube video was, it's kind of quite complicated because um, first thing I would say to recap is check everything else, bushing, uh, sorry, depthing, bushing, cleaning, obviously, end shake, side shake, adjustment of the escapement. Uh, we had a really absolute classic this week of somebody who spent a long time fixing the clock couldn't figure out why it wasn't working properly and I said have you checked that the case isn't rocking you know um, which obviously is a loss of energy so that I check that the movement is sound that the case can't rock if it's a long case clock or a tall case clock check that it's really well both bolted to the wall because again we've had that where somebody said um, I've got this clock it's running fine but uh after four or five days it stops so quick question for john why does that clock stop after four or five days um long case clock yeah um because the weights have the the gut lines have unwound to the extent that at least one of the weights has um got down to roughly the same length level as the um, pendulum bob and it's starting it's got the same it, and it gives it the same natural frequency and you can actually see you very often can see them starting to rock from side to side with the pendulum and it um it 
it must be quite a small amount of energy that gets robbed, but it, it must rob energy from the escapement and eventually makes it stop. I mean, it's uh, mo most customers, when I tell them that, don't believe me. They think that I'm just some lunatic that's wandered off the street. But once I've actually screwed the clock to the wall and they see it fixes the problem, they do believe me. But it's quite a subtle, subtle effect. It can be um, it can be almost um, uh, impossible to see the movement. So anyway, my point is with the spring, do everything else. And then uh, if for whatever reason um, you want to replace the spring to extend the duration of the clock, then life's quite complicated because, as we said last week, not only is the metallurgy of modern springs probably very different to historic springs, um, but there's this issue of the cube, uh, the thickness, this value here is proportional, uh, uh, the cube of the strength of that of the spring is proportional to the cube of the thickness. So if you change that value by a bit, I think in my YouTube video, I did the calculation of uh, if a spring's 0.4 of a millimeter and you get a spring that's 0.42 of a millimeter, you might think, well, that's close enough. What difference could that make? Well, 0.4 to 0.42 is about a 5% increase. But because of the cube law, the increase in strength is about 12.5%. So you can see that a little change in thickness um, is a big change in, in strength. Got another question in here. Great question about commercially made bushings. We'll get onto that a bit later. Please remind me. Um, I realized another thing about this spring thing, and I don't want it to take up the whole session, but when you look at a clock like this, which is a two train, uh, mid 20th century uh, spring driven clock, I guess those of you that are not completely new to horology will be familiar with this, is that I realized that the manufacturers are kind of like a penny dropped, use the same barrel on the same spring for both trains, even though when the clock is new, they'd probably get away with a spring in the going train, so the time side of things, significantly less strong than the striking side. Uh, maybe like even 20, 25, 30% of the striking uh, spring, because all the going train has to do is to make the hands go round. And of course, um, I've lost my lovely bit of wood, um, to lift uh, this mechanism here, which releases the striking. So already one might argue, ah, oh, clock's working. Uh, one might argue that the going train is already pretty significantly overdriven. Um, so that raises a kind of um, professional practice or what you might call ethical question of if you replace that spring, do you actually replace it with a significantly weaker one in order to preserve the rest of the clock, the pinions and wheel teeth and so on. Anyway, we won't get into that now. And kind of even worse than that, I realized that, so what um, dictates in this clock here, uh, the strength of the spring from a manufacturer's perspective is the spring um, here in the striking side. For beginners who are out there, this clock has got two gear boxes. One um, runs up this side of the clock and it drives the pendulum. It's the time side of things, or what we call the going train. And the other one on this side drives the striking train. If you've got a clock with um, a chiming train as well, then typically you've got three main springs and you've got three holes, winding apertures in the dial. But what I realized about the Smith's clocks, and I don't know whether it's same brother makers, is that they use that same spring in this clock, which has no striking work. So it doesn't even have that job to do of lifting the, uh, you know, releasing the striking train. So it occurred to me, it would be a really cool experiment, which I'll do, let's just let this person in, a really cool experiment to actually see what these clocks would run on. But then you're into that ethical dilemma of change, if you decide to change the spring, do you actually replace it with something that's very different from what the manufacturer might have specified and then we're into a uh, question of accountability. And just one last thing, which is a really kind of slightly controversial thing to throw in here, 
um, in terms of our customers. Now, my um, main work is in the museum and uh, historic kind of um, heritage environment um, with some private clients as well. And this will come as a bit of a surprise to maybe some people, but when I discuss, if we get to the point where we need uh, to replace a spring, or that might be an option. Um, I think John's got a really good example of this again with a chiming clock. Often when following a discussion, those clients are actually quite happy understanding that the clock isn't new, so the context has changed, that in fact, um, they're happy to wind the clock a couple of times a week. Uh, John, do you wanna just give us that recent case study? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I've had a couple of um, striking um, uh, chiming clocks, in other words, kind with the three, the, the three trains that you just mentioned. And the train that often seems to struggle the most is the one that actually does the chiming. And I've noticed that although the, the striking and the going trains can easily get through a week, the actual bit that does the Westminster chime um, is a little bit iffy. It, uh, and in fact, I did a very extended experiment a couple of years ago to see to see whether they, you know, I just sat in front of a movement one day and just kind of just kept flicking the thing just to see the mechanism going to see whether it really would do um, a whole eight days. And in fact, it only just managed to do just over seven. And I and but sometimes it's less than seven. And and um, I've I've mentioned it to customers and said, you know. You soon know when the thing's not uh, chiming properly because it starts to slow down. So you know, just just wind it up again when it starts to slow down, and they're fine with it. I mean, I I suppose that um, might be uh, kind of a bit of um, an interesting idea to people, uh, but certainly one again in the live chat um, that, uh, and this is particularly the case if you ever get into that kind of museum and heritage world because they very much see the mainspring as part of the, what they call the integrity of the object. They don't see it necessarily as a consumable, like, uh, and we're probably always dangerous to get into analogies, but you know, where does a thing become part of the clock? I just bought an old um, push bike last week off eBay, uh, 1970s thing, and it probably had its sort of original tires on, which are completely shot. So obviously you can't ride the thing, and so it sort of had smoke coming out of my ears, trying to think about what I was going to do. But anyway, uh, to discuss, so how are we doing for time? It's actually probably time to just cut the uh, spring conversation just for the time being. When we come back from a really quick break, uh, we will talk about what clocks to move on to next. And I'll need some help from uh, you people in America, because I know virtually nothing about American clocks. So. Uh, let's come back in literally at 20 past, if that's all right. Okay. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. Sorry, for really short break there. Um, just allows us more than anything just to kind of reassess where we are. So in this next session, we're going to run through the progression of clocks and why, and you will have some great feedback on that. Again, keep that live chat going. It's really important to us. 
Uh, we've had a couple of questions. The first one is, uh, I think it's Daval, the make of clock, single train. Um, that's, is that a pendulum clock? Can you tell us in the live chat, please? Or does it have a balance, you know, lever escapement? Um, let's, before we can make a comment on that. And the other question that's come up, which is a brilliant question, which we do tackle in our forthcoming chapter on bushing and depthing, and that's my view on commercially made bushes. And that, again, could take a long time. It'd be interesting to know, actually, if any of you people have got a background in uh, metallurgy from a kind of engineering perspective, because I don't, so it would be good to have your uh, opinion on that. In fact, one of those 10 minute talks, if you do or know somebody who's a metallurgist by trade, it'd be really cool to hear what they have to say on the issue of materials for bushing. Okay, so here's our question from Dave. Where do we go once we've tackled the single train clock? And why, in fact, did we start with this? Well, we didn't start with this, is the answer. We started with a rather grubby version. We actually started with this. And some of you will recognize it. It's a bit of a relic, this one, but perfectly fine. We started writing about French clocks and I can't quite remember why that was. I think we had just bought a collection of about 50 French clocks. So probably we, uh, they were right in front of our face. That but, might have had something to do with it. <laughs> might have done. So we wrote about French clocks for about three years and also spent quite a lot of time down the pub talking about French clocks and not writing. But anyway, and then eventually we kind of had a moment of uh, realization that these are not um, it, the, these are not a great place to start. So should I use this as a workplace every machine? Yeah. Some, so the question was: somebody selling a Daval, um, which I think think is an English make of clock, mid twentieth century pendulum clock. It's got a pendulum. If it's a single train, yeah, that's a great place to start. If it's reasonably priced, get it and go for it. So we wrote about French clocks, which again we'll publish eventually, but we realized actually that for the beginner, um, these things are quite small. Uh, the single train ones are relatively rare. The pivots are very hard. So we've kind of racked up a whole lot of reasons why not to start here. We'll come back to these in a minute. And so we racked our brains and looked on the internet and thought, what clock can people buy that's mass produced and it had to be mass produced because we wanted the option and again this is for the beginner if say for instance there was a wheel that was damaged that you could get another part for it without having to make one because my personal experience of starting in clock making was that people just said oh make a part get a lathe and of course that's not particularly useful information if you're just trying to get off the starting line so we found these can I, can I just interject for a moment uh, uh, a lot of people also, I think that those French pondul clocks that Matthew just showed an example of, the parts are interchangeable. And every now and then, if you're really lucky, you might find two of those movements where the parts are interchangeable. But generally speaking, although they look like one another, they're not. That's uh, absolutely right. Absolutely right, John. In fact, on the NAWCC forum today, we were talking about that a little bit because those movements have got sort of multiple stages to their lives. They start off in one factory, essentially, then often move to a different factory to be finished. So they look very similar, but in fact, they're not interchangeable. And we also wanted a clock that really kind of had as much as we could going for it. We knew that uh, depthing and bushing are gonna be issues, adjusting the anchor recoil escapement is gonna be an issue a train count, uh, motion work, uh, a mainspring and a going barrel. So we found these uh, Enfield clocks. And as um, the live chat said, there are other makers. It's, we just happened to use the Smith's Enfield because they kind of are about 20, 30 pounds on uh, the internet here in Europe. And they're the kind of line of least resistance to getting an actual clock. If you learn about these, um, you uh, will learn a lot. And if you get really, really stuck, you can always opt out and get parts from another one. And in fact, as John said the other week, 
we experimented by actually swapping parts through the post and the clocks run absolutely fine. So yeah, so what you get from this, as I said, you learn about motive force, motive power from the mainspring in the barrel, which we've talked a lot about. You do a train count, so you figure out the frequency of the oscillator, you get to adjust um, the anchor recoil escapement. And a good thing about these clocks is that this front um, bearing piece here, and I've taken the escapement out of it because I was doing something else with it, and the back are not pinned in place. So you can move the, uh, the axle or the arbor of the pellets up and down to adjust the escapement. And I think if you spend time on a clock like this with adjustable bearings for the escapement with an anchor recoil escapement, you really, really get to understand how that thing works and how changing the distance between the escape wheel and the pallets affects uh, internal and external drop and so on. So really good place to begin. But um, what we've found is that people are super enthusiastic and in fact, they get through one of these clocks in about three or four days sometimes and they're going, right, what next? So that's what I'm going to answer now. So the obvious progression from um, from the single train Enfield is uh, this thing, which is basically the same clock, but with two trains. Let's just move that up a bit because it's a little bit close. Um, and as you can see here, uh, get it the right way up, poor thing. Um, although I say it's only got two trains, the learning curve here really starts to ramp up and it starts to ramp up for two or three reasons, in fact. Uh, my son, who you saw last week, found that putting the wheels back in between the plates of this was not kind of like twice as hard as a single train. It's like 10 times harder. It's a bit of a, um, yeah, an order of magnitude more difficult. So there's the actual handling of the parts. But probably the biggest thing to get your head around with a two train clock as opposed to a timepiece clock is the phase relationship of the wheels in the striking train. So for uh, beginners, what I'm talking about here, if you can see, is that um, if we can get it to run again, that would be nice. Maybe it's, maybe it's not going to run again. Um, is that uh, when you put the clock back together, unlike the going, you know, the single train clock, it doesn't matter where you put those wheels, uh, they, it, they've got no consciousness of what the next wheel is doing. So you can put them together and that's fine. With the striking train, it's not as simple as that. You have to get the phase relationship correct. And we explain it in our forthcoming book, how to do that. But again, it needs a bit more de dexterity uh, and, and so on. And it's going to take you quite a lot longer. Otherwise, what will happen is this thing called warning, which is part of the process of striking, um, is not set up correctly and the clock will jam or it will be stopped when it's lifting the hammer and it won't restart and so on. So we've got the, the uh, you've got a lot of new parts to learn. You've got the fly, of course, up here, which is a, a sort of governor and air brake thing. You've got the star wheel here, which lifts the hammer to strike the hours. But if you get through this, the beauty of it is that you've got a striking clock, which is absolutely fantastic because you set the thing going and everybody who visits the house goes, wow, you're a clockmaker and everything's um, cool. So that's a really good second uh, stage. Now, what I would say here is that this is where you a lot can help me out because as you can see, um, for the beginners amongst us, this clock has got this mechanism here, which works in conjunction with this pin here and this stepped cam called the snail. And what these three components do is they count the number of hours. So um, on the, sorry, on the thing, is that um, this drop down visible? This thing, is it visible? All oh. oh, right, okay. So you can, I, I can't see the screen, but so this cam rotates with the hour hand and it dictates the number of hours struck. So this is called rack striking. Now to make matters more difficult for the beginner, 
is that there are actually two very sort of different systems for counting the hours. The other system uh, is called count wheel striking, which is a sequential system, which probably actually links back to John's point before about the mainspring uh, running out of juice and the clock stopping is that that system isn't kind of self-correcting unlike the rack striking system. So here, what I would say is if you can find one, and this is probably where the American clocks come in because I think a lot of them are count wheel striking and some of you might uh, be nodding there. So maybe at this point, a good next step would be to get an American clock because you'd get the experience of uh, working with open main springs. So that's where the spring isn't contained within a barrel. Plus you'd also get the experience of working on count wheel striking. And those clocks, I don't have much experience of them, so I need to keep my mouth closed really. Um, but they're rather uh, different, so they're different dynamic. And um, a lot, I think, of the levers are made out of wires. So you might get one that's been adjusted by somebody in the past uh, incorrectly. So yeah, maybe an American clock with open springs, count wheel striking might be the next stage. What I would say after that is to move on to French clocks. Yeah, um, I a question on the live chat about three train clocks. Personally, I wouldn't go there at this stage. I would stick with two train clocks. Now, I'm um, really happy to kind of, um, uh, you know, hear what you think about that, because, of course, if you ever become a commercial uh, clock repairer, and we, remember, we're talking about beginners here, is that you will experience um, a, a lot of three train clocks. So this is going train time, striking train, uh, striking the hours and half hours maybe, and quarter striking on gongs or bells, Westminster, Whittington. For me, those clocks are so different in the sense of getting all the wheels in the frame and the phase relationships and the multiplicity, if there is such a word, of different um, uh, striking mechanisms. Again, John, do you want to just step in there with a a kind of view on that, on, on the way that those clocks work and how different they can be? Um, I'm just trying to think, whenever I pick, whenever I actually work on one of those, I always think the, the, the type of striking I'm working on, when I start, I always think, oh yeah, this is the easy one. <laughs> and I always find that actually neither of them is the easy one. I just have got a very short memory, I think. Right, okay. So um, I would say, personally, hold back on the three train clocks at this stage. You remember, in your clock making life, um, you've only repaired two clocks, a single train and a two train clock. I would get more experience of two train, and particularly with these French clocks. Now, again, for beginners, this um, clock is this movement, sorry, and again, I don't quite know what it's like in the states but certainly in Europe these clocks are um, using the word very uh, re uh, respectfully quite common they're not um, they're relatively inexpensive you can pick them up for 20 to 50 pounds uh, with a case and a dial and everything they're not expensive clocks you know in relative terms and what they do is they really get you good on things like depthing on um, the Smith clocks that we've seen, they're actually quite sort of um, accommodating where it comes to depthing issues. If you get a depthing issue on a clock like this, because the thing is a lot smaller and the pinions are smaller, you can't kind of, there's not as much tolerance. Also what you get here on this particular type of model is, I'll just try and get a bit of better light on it. It's a bit, um, bit of a relic, is you see this component here with, different notches in its periphery. This is called the count wheel. So unlike the rack striking one we saw a few minutes ago, this is the other system. And you really need to get experience of this system of striking because it shares some of the principles of rack striking, but actually they're significantly different. Now, the other thing that French clocks will give you that these 20th century uh, Smith's clocks won't, is that the steel in these clocks um, is 
uh, quite hard. Sorry, Frankie. Right, okay. Uh, it's quite hard. Do you so, clean that, Clark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've spent the whole week cleaning it, yeah. Right. Um, the, uh, so these arbors, our axles, um, are um, hardened and tempered. And if you were to start on this as a beginner, possibly, probably what you'll find is that you end up breaking off some part of that arbor, the pivot, the small diameter at the end, which forms the bearing. So here you're kind of making a little step towards more of the ballistics and the kind of feel of the components of a carriage clock or even some larger watches like pocket watches when you look at the way these things are made. So what this clock will give you, well, this actual one will give you a really great insight into the difference between cleaning and refinishing, because my aim, and we're gonna to come to clean later, would be to get this running, obviously not to leave the dust and three dimensional dirt on there, but not to get rid of the tarnish and refinish the plates. Uh, you've got some light surface rust here, which you would decide to do something about. Um, really importantly here, if I can find, um, maybe the springs have been taken out of this. I'll find it on the other one. Um, you've got a, a different way of regulating the clock. So you've got a whole sub mechanism here on the back. I'll turn it the right way up, sorry. You've got a whole um, sub mechanism here on the back, uh, which is called the Broco regulation. And again, I think American clocks, some American clocks have got a similar kind of system, but all overall, everything is smaller uh, finer, easier to break, but incredibly satisfying when you get them going. And the, although these clocks might surprise you, have kind of got a bit of a, a, a bad reputation by some English repairers, I, I don't know why, um, there's a lot of them I suppose, is that they're incredibly good quality. They're very, very beautifully made, uh, very satisfying and keep really good time once they're, uh, once they're repaired. Um, yeah, I'll just talk about springs in a while. So if you get one of these count wheel striking French clocks and they're called Pondule de Paris uh, as a kind of generic name, then you can move on to exactly the same thing. This one's got square plates, um, but it's exactly the same, uh, but it's got rack striking. Um, so we've got, you might recognize this component here very similar to the Enfield clock we saw, but the snail, this cam that in conjunction with the rack counts the number of hours, you can see looks a bit crazy at the beginning, but it doesn't have those discrete steps on it. So you've got to get used to this stepless snail system, which can catch you out because again, there's a really important phase relationship issue, which we write about between the, uh, the wheel down here, which is called the minute wheel, rather perversely, even though it doesn't have the minute hand on it, and the hour wheel here. The other thing I'll say about French clocks is it's really important to get the strength of these. You can see there are two springs here. This one, um, it's a little tapered wire spring, uh, is for the stop wheel detent, and this one down here is for the hammer. And you can see somebody's, well, you won't probably know that it's meant to be down here, but adjusting these springs is really cool and good fun. And if you just get those balanced nicely, it means that the main springs don't have to do extra work. So this would be my next uh, place to go. Domestic 20th century mass produced mantle clocks followed by French clocks, uh, which were made at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century. So we're gonna just, before we go for our break, we're gonna spend a couple of minutes on a question. And uh, that question is, uh, what is depthing? So we won't labor this too much, but we'll certainly uh, come back to it. I've put it the right way up, come and read. Um, so here's our little clock. And what we've got here are intermeshing wheels. So if you, and again, it's gonna be a little bit of a scruffy drawing, I'm afraid, but you've got a wheel here, which is um, driving a small wheel here. I just need to get rid of this drop down thing. 
so I good that's that we got that so um, let's say this wheel brass wheel is rotating that direction the um, pinion is going to be rotating in the other direction is that right and um, what happens is at the center of these wheels we've got uh, pivots of simple bearings and the action of one wheel, wheel rotating the force uh, and the reaction forces those wheels apart. If it wasn't for the bearings holding them in place, they'd naturally get forced apart. So over time, particularly with contaminated lubrication, what happens is broadly, this one will kind of go in that direction and this one will wear in that direction, which is not a big deal. But when we look very closely at this interface here between the two, when the clock is new, the wheel and the pinion is designed to run at a theoretical optimal position. And this, these circles, these are not the outside diameter of the wheels. These are called, um, hands them out. These are called the pitch circle diameters. And if you imagine um, as the bearings wear, these pitch circle diameters begin to move apart from one another. And what that means is that the efficiency of the meshing reduces, particularly as they move apart, what you get is something called action before the line of center. Sorry, beginners, this is a, all going off on a little bit of a tangent, pardon the pun, but eventually the clock will stop. And so what you have to do is you have to put those wheels or the wheel and the pinion back at some kind of optimal meshing. And you do that by a process called bushing. And what we find is there are lots of people out there just putting new bushes in well, they're not um, uh, going through the process of depthing. And what depthing is, is establishing the optimal mesh of two mobiles. Uh, we don't have time for it today, um, but what we can do, if anybody's interested and let us know in the live chat, uh, when we come back next week, as part of our um, super exciting Christmas giveaway quiz, is we'll get a depthing tool out and we'll talk a little bit more about depthing because without wanting to put the cat among the pigeons, as they say, um, depthing without bushing is a kind of meaningless um, operation. You just end up doing a lot of work and a lot of change to the machine uh, in a kind of hit or miss way. So depthing is a critical precursor to bushing and it means finding the proper mesh of those two uh, mobiles. So um, let's have a little break. And when we come back, we'll very quickly talk about the next stage of progression. And then we're gonna be out of time a little bit, but we'll talk uh, about this idea of cleaning. I think, sorry, I'm talking such a lot, as I said, uh, keep the live chat coming. I think what these sort of important subjects, uh, really good to begin to dig into them, but me sort of telling you what I think uh, is of limited value. So please keep the live chat going and let us know uh, and steer it in your direction. So we'll see you in, uh, let's make it just a couple of minutes at um, 6.46, all right?
Right, uh, welcome back. Very quick break. Um, loads of great live chat. So thank you so much. Um, let me just move that back. Uh, there's um, somebody has asked uh, whether I'll talk about um, some of the clocks I've worked on, which I will, but um, there's a deal to be struck here. I'll talk about some of the clocks I've worked on if you talk about some of the clocks that you've worked on. So for every one of my 10 minute talks, I want one of your 10 minute talks. So please let us know um, that you're willing to do that. That would be great. I think maybe a good one to start with, uh, I think people associate me with working on the Swan Automaton, which I can talk about, but it's kind of three clocks bolted together. So maybe to get started next week, we'll spend 10 minutes talking about John Harrison's 1727 uh, regulator clock, which is in the collection of Leeds uh, museums, which I took apart a few years ago, and I've got lots of uh, nice photographs, so let's talk about that. So very quickly, where do we go next? We've done those so-called mass-produced clocks. I would say if you've got access to them, the next step would be uh, an European and maybe, you know, maybe American made uh, 30 hour duration, right, stand up here, um, long case clock movement. And let's just move that up. And the reason I'd say to look at one of the, these, there's nothing technically here per se that you're going to learn, uh, that you're going to learn new on top of, say, for instance, a French clock with count wheel striking. They're basically the same kind of thing. But what you get here is that you move into a totally different era of clockmaking. And one of the things, again, we've been talking about on the NAWCC forum this week is screws. Now, if we um, look at screws from 19th, late 19th century clocks and 20th century clocks, they tend to be standardized. Whereas on these clocks, they're not. The standards were kind of local standards. So if you've got a strip thread or a screw that's missing, you've got a pretty major challenge of making a screw to match that thread, uh, which you'll need a screw plate or a screw cutting lathe. So this would be where I would go, but there's a really a more important point here with these clocks, I'll let you have a little look inside, um, is two things. Firstly, is there kind of, this is what, 200 and so many years old, um, so you can see here, you've got a real conservation challenge in as much as this has still got its marking out of depthing, which is really great, just what we're talking about, from the maker, which is really cool and something we really want to uh, look after. Uh, but also it's got a lot of previous repairs and previous repairs, repairs, repairs are really cool because they're work workarounds. The way that I see it is that I just shrug my shoulders and accept them. I'm not particularly interested in any kind of putting things right per se, because I personally, professionally don't believe that can be done. But you've got a whole sort of layering of almost organic development of the object since it was made to the point it lands on your desk. And of course, as a practitioner, you're responsible for the outcome of that. So that's the bit that begins to interest me as much as the technical challenge. So with a clock like this, inevitably you have a lot more making of parts that are either broken or missing or beyond uh, re reasonable repair and so on. And you've also got work like this, which is hand forged. So you never find two clocks that are you know, identical. Um, they're all got a kind of different story uh, and they're really cool. So a European or American equivalent of a 30 hour duration tall case clock would be a great uh, next step. This one um, has got count wheel striking just very quickly, but the count wheel isn't visible, it's on some of them. It's actually hidden under here and you can see the, uh, the notches are the, the gaps in the count wheel here, which engage with this piece of material on the back called the count wheel dent. So these are really cool because they're very organic. And of course the uh, natural partner to the uh, 30 hour duration tall case clock is the eight day duration 
talk his clock. And again, Matthew, can I just say something? Sorry, yeah. I was muted. Um, can you just go back to that one temporarily, just for a second? About that. Um, and turn it out. Oh, oh, no, that's the sorry. I don't know if it's my imagination or whether it's to do with your illumination, but that's, it looks to me as if an area of that plate's gone pink, which uh, might be useful for what we're going to talk about next. It, yeah, it actually isn't too bad, John. I think it is the lighting you're talking about here. Yeah. There is a little bit of, of that, but it's worth, I mean, keep that in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry to interrupt. That's all right. Um, I'm just trying to figure out what time it is. Fifty-two. Okay, we've got eight minutes. Um, so the next obvious progression for me uh, is the European eight-day duration uh, tall case clock. You can see here it's rack striking, um, and again, you're not going to actually learn much technically that's different from the French clock or even the Enfield clock, to be honest. But again, it's this idea that these clocks are a couple of hundred years old or more. They've been through many hands of repairers and maintenance and so on. So you get um, challenges like this rack arm here, which I've just about to finish a video on for the YouTube channel. Um, and you can see here that this has had several uh, repairs. It's no longer functional. And also the rack spring, this piece of wire has been repaired. There's, these clocks are, um, you have to do some detective work because you can see here where the screw is, there's also another little hole there. Um, so tell me please in the live chat what that hole is for. Uh, just a couple of interesting features on this particular clock. Um, oh, that's <laughs> really cool there. Um, right, okay. Uh, one is that it doesn't have the, the, the gut lines go on here. It doesn't have grooves. It's got plain barrels, which is quite nice. And secondly, uh, leading us neatly on to our last part of the conversation is that you can see very plainly here that this clock has been put in a bath of some chemical, maybe ammonia or something. And, um, and uh, it's not been fully submerged. So the ammonia, I guess it was ammonia, it could have been xylene or something, has stripped out some of the material from, it's etched or chemically corroded the plate, but not the whole thing. Um, and we see this surprisingly often where clocks are put in a bath of uh, chemical without being disassembled or in fact fully submerged. So very quickly, and we're gonna to have to come back to this um, next week because we're obviously running out of time, um, uh, we've got a chapter about cleaning uh, in the book, and I would say uh, really something just to be thinking about for next week, and again, keep it going in the live chat, and we'll follow up with that during the week. But what is cleaning? Uh, the question we had was, can you clean a clock by immersing the whole thing um, in an ultrasonic tank or in a bath of... Um, uh, solvent or something and the answer I think uh, and I'd love to hear what you think is not really of course you you can go through the process and I think this is confusing because uh, a lot of watch makers will put a watch movement with its um, a lot of watch makers in the watch uh, for the watch movement through a cleaning machine ultrasonic cleaning machine assembled with the escapement out and the barrel out maybe and use auto lubrication, um, auto lubrication, and it doesn't really work for clocks. And the killer point is, it's not needed because clocks, as we've seen, are quite big. Um, and kind of what I'm going to leave you with, because we're going to have to come back to this, we're running out of time, is that question what is cleaning? What is dirt? And what I would say, the first thing to kind of get your head around is working and non-working surfaces. If you, uh, if you treat a clock in some kind of a universal way, let's say for instance, you put everything in, in a tank or some chemical bath, you're not differentiating between the bearings and the working surfaces 
and the rest of the clock, as in like the chassis, if you like, um, because as far as I'm concerned, all the rest of the clock does is hold those working surfaces in place. So I'm, you know, the bit that I'm particularly interested in, in terms of co concentrating my efforts and cleaning activity, and it's not to say the rest of it remains dirty per se, uh, is the bearings, because we want to clear out oil, old contaminated oil from the bearings, and we want to replace that oil with fresh lubrication. As Abraham Louis Briggy said, give me the perfect oil and I'll give you the perfect watch. Well, there is no such thing, particularly in a clock, because clocks typically are not sealed from uh, inorganic dust that's floating about in the air, and that lands on the oil and it forms a grinding paste. However, dirt, say for instance, on the frame of a clock, doesn't have the same detrimental effect it would have in the bearings. That would be my first point. And of course, it's not definitive. Uh, it's just something to think about. And also the second thing I would say is that the context in which a clock lives or exists like us changes. So I hear a lot of um, comment that, well, it's not what the maker would have wanted. It's not how it came out of the factory. Those things may or may not be true. We know very little actually about what makers wanted. And of course, they were supplying an incredibly different product to what we're dealing with. So sign of, from a practice perspective, um, all I can do the best I can is to be accountable on that day, the day that I'm doing the practice for the work I do. And so in cleaning, that tends to be very, very, very minimal. And I think we're about out of time, aren't we? What time is it? Uh, right, we've got about two minutes. So we need to come back to cleaning if that's all right. Sorry if we haven't really dug into it. The answer is we can discuss it for the rest of our lives and it'll be really good fun. And hopefully we'll all learn from uh, that interaction. As I say, we talk about cleaning in our book. And I think the third thing I would say there is the, the difference between cleaning, which I think of as like washing, sort of like washing your car, and refinishing, because I think those two things are confused and I don't have a problem with refinishing, but if I'm gonna do refinishing, I wanna call it refinishing and not call it cleaning. Uh, anyway, three slightly controversial uh, elements there to which we obviously need to return. Um, now there's a question about what's the wire in the hole. Do we know which wire we're talking about? No, no, that, that was, um, I, I know what that was referring to. That was in response to your question as to what was that hole in the plate for near the spring? All oh, right, okay. So this um, hole in the plate here is a steady, what we call a steady pin hole. So on all the clock components, you get a screw that fixes something down, but that screw doesn't locate it per se, it's located by a little steel pin in the brass hole. So what this tells us here is that at some earlier date, maybe originally, but maybe not, there was actually a larger component here that had a screw hole and a steady pin hole. And that may inform what we do about this spring if we decide to replace it or we decide to keep it and so on. And that's one of the cool things about these uh, clocks is that they're an adventure of thinking and I personally think the thinking is the coolest part of clock making uh, and the the doing is kind of the end sort of result. Anyway we had a question about bushes which we'll need to answer um, another week but we've got um, commercially made bushes here so we can talk about those. We've got bushing uh, wire the uh, in the magic yellow box We'll talk about that. And we've got these things, uh, which are kind of pre-made uh, commercial bushes as well. So there's another subject for us. And I think there's a question about lube, which presumably meant what lube do you use, what lubrication? Almost exclusively for clock train bearings, uh, we use Mobius D series, which is now part of the Swatch Group. And that's a mix of organic, um, so natural, sorry, lubricant, and mineral oil. Of course, there are fully synthetic lubricants now, 
um, primarily for watches. Again, we need to talk about lubrication in a, in a subsequent week. So as always, uh, it's been a bit of a rush. We run out of time. We've got loads to talk about in future. So please spread the word, keep the questions coming. And next week uh, we will do a Christmas quiz, which will be 10, 10 question quiz uh, for everybody with a prize giveaway. And we'll also look inside a clock by John Harrison. And if you join us then you'll get to see pictures that nobody else on the planet has seen other than me, of course. So I uh, hope you can join us then and wishing you a really happy, healthy and safe Christmas and see you next week. Thank you.